um, a, a, did a PhD in psychology in UCD um, prior to um, going to the US to do a postdoc at Stanford, where I ultimately ended up um, sort of staying for nine years, most recently as research faculty in um, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And um, my, well, yeah, I'm a psychologist, so I'm, a lot of my presentation is going to be about our sort of general approach. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve, um, how we're doing that, um, and, and a bit of an introduction to the team that we've assembled. Because um, as you'll probably be hearing and understanding, the, the, uh, the building as an AI company does um, lend itself to a slightly different team composition and set of expertise. Um, so I, I think uh, just as a very brief background for how I ended up here. Um, I have I spent a very brief time in London as a software engineer uh, when I was just when I graduated from from psychology, and um, I was always when I went back to the uh, to kind of clinical science. I was always uh, intrigued and just inspired by uh, how technology could solve some of these great problems of of access that we have and scale scaling the rare expertise. Um, but also just sort of circumventing all of the sort of stuff of that we know of the clinic, the having to be at a certain place at a time and um, waiting for an appointment and so on. And that was more than 20 years ago. And, you know, it's kind of shocking that we're really only starting to understand this now. But well, during my time at Stanford, I, I did uh, learn some amazing um, got to work on some incredible projects and some cutting edge, the so treatment development work. But, you know, I was always plagued by this idea that, you know, the knowledge that no matter how gorgeous these treatments were that we were building, um, it didn't really matter if 99% of the population would never get access to them. Um, and so for me, Wobot has always been about access. It's always been about how can we um, solve this problem of how people can access high quality tools. And we uh, broadly define access as beyond those things that I spoke about, the logistics of having to be at an appointment time at a certain time and place and, you know, being on a wait list and things like that, but to include emotional accessibility as well. Um, because actually the, the, the still the leading barrier for people seeking care um, is stigma. Um, so, so our vision is that everybody really should have their own access to uh, a personal health assistant, right? They should have access to high quality um, support when and where they need it and something that learns and grows with you because that is the human experience. And so currently we've built um, through this one agent, which is Wobot, Wobot is able to deliver um, a suite of wellness tools and um, things that specifically address behavioural health, but also things for actual diagnostics that are used in, as, uh, sorry, for diagnoses that are used in treatment settings and um, for which we're seeking FDA clearance and they would be our prescription digital therapeutics. Um, we're early in this work, uh, somewhat early, we, and in uh, May we were really privileged to, um, based on the data that we've um, had so far, um, to be able to be awarded a breakthrough designation at the FDA for our postpartum depression product. Um, but I think the breakthrough that we really had is that we've created a conversational agent that is capable of forming a therapeutic bond with users. And um, because, of course, that is a mechanism in and of itself in healthcare, in mental health care in particular. Um, so let me share a little bit about the problem that we're solving. Um, but we see really, you know, capacity is the issue. Mental health, of course, mental health programs, uh, mental health problems, excuse me, are growing exponentially. And um, I used to, when I used to give talks, I would say, uh, I would talk about how, you know, the World Health Organization estimates that by 2025, depression will be the leading cause of disability. And then I went to sort of get a reference a few years ago to find that it had already happened. And so this is the, the pace at which um, it, mental health illnesses are, are really exploding. Um, but the issue is really the capacity. There, there aren't enough clinicians to go around, and this has been a well-known problem for a long time. There won't be enough clinicians, and you know, um, people have actually done this calculation around: could we increase the amount of training places? And there's just we're never going to be able to address the need. 
Um, and so uh, some data points for you based in the US, but about 40% of the US population live in no access, designated no access areas, which means they have no mental health professional at all um, in a quite a large county radius. And 60% and of US counties have no psychiatrist at all either. Um, and so we think demand outstrips supply by about 25 times. And if any of you have known somebody who have tried to seek help in the Irish system, um, unless you are very, very severe, it is really challenging. I've just had this recently as well from a friend asking me, to, could I recommend a child and adolescent psychologist? It's, it's incredibly hard um, to find people even in private practice. And um, the other piece that we're, the other problem that we're trying to solve is that actually engagement in therapy is really poor. So even if those services did exist, and there is something about the fact that a lot of people don't present. And so we know this from university settings where there is actually comparatively a few more services that are set up. There are peer um, based services, there's phone lines, free um, free services as well. And actually uh, people don't necessarily present. So there's something about engagement there as well. One uh, data point that I think is really pertinent among younger people and um, that or, or that is um, yeah, it's relevant for younger people is that the average time between onset of symptoms and first seeing a therapist is 11 years. And um, but of course, most people will never get that far. And again, as I said, stigma is the main reason. And then the final problem that speaking as an intervention scientist is that um, our outcomes are not that great. I mean, they're good. We have about 50 percent of people doing well with the most evidence based treatment approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy and so on. Um, but the uh, what they call the research practice gap has become a chasm. And um, the things that we do in the lab are not necessarily practiced with fidelity in the community. And so only about 50 percent of doctor level clinicians are practicing manualized treatments. Those are the treatments that we know have worked in the lab and, and you know, that we tend to tend to research on. Um, and so it's uh, it can be a bit of uh, I don't say the Wild West, but I don't have a better phrase. Um, it, it, it's, it's variable. There's a lot of variation in the system, basically. Um, and the final piece is that it's been so painful and painfully slow to innovate in psychiatry. So we're still using the same four classes of drugs that we've been that were developed in the 50s and 60s. Um, and you know, to be able to, what we really need to do is get at mechanism. Why is it that some of our treatments work? Under what circumstances and for whom? Um, but to do that, you really need large numbers of people uh, attending the clinic, and that would take a very long time to do these trials. It's not impossible. We were doing some of that work at Stanford, but these are five year plus multi million dollar trials um, and, and certainly multi site trials, which are just long and slow to do. Um, so we think that the way to address this immediately to tackle some of these problems is actually to be 100% to build something that's 100% automated. So yes, that means we can't rebuild, we can't rebuild an AI therapist, but we can enable people with better tools um, to, you know, remove some of the, the, the load from the system to flatten the curve, as it were. And um, so to give you a sense of some of the scale that we have at the moment, um, Wobot is exchanging about five million messages a week um, at this point. And what's interesting is that Wobot can deliver like the same techniques from some of these best, most evidence based approaches we have, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy in the same way again and again, right? Because it is automated, because it is um, uh, uh, software. Um, and obviously, we want to build for meaningful engagement. And um, what does that mean? Um, what's different about therapy that we can do with Wobot? And that was the prom promise of tech delivered solutions all along, but never quite got there because it wasn't conversational or relational, um, is the fact that we can talk somebody through uh, a technique in the moment that they need to use it. So often when you see a patient, you know, they're talking about their what happened in the previous week. And we're, you know, you might be hypothesizing about how to, you know, strategize the next time that happens. Well, here's the thing about being in a difficult spot, being in a state of um, emotional distress means that you have diminished cognitive ability to be able to think through and strategize and go, oh, yeah, actually, remember that thing my therapist told me that is really hard. And yet that is the thing that we want our patients to do most, because that's really where the growth and the learning happens. 
So when you have something that's very easy to reach out to, that's just a conversation, you have this opportunity to help somebody feel better and use those techniques in the moment that they need the most. So that's what we mean by meaningful engagement. And it is interesting that almost 80% of all of the conversations people have with Wobot happen outside of clinical hours. And this also varies according to the diagnostic um, vertical. So for postpartum depression, 80% of those conversations are happening between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., which is quite amazing, but not if you've had a child and you've been up in the middle of the night with them and you're alone and then you realize, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, the other piece about a meaningful engagement is that, uh, and I'll show you some data about this in a moment, is that Wobot develops a human uh, level therapeutic bond really early with people. What is therapeutic bond? It's actually well defined in, in this field um, and it's things like trust, mutual trust, um, non-judgmental status um, and approach and, you know, just the feeling that I can really share and be myself and be authentic. Of course, that makes the engagement with a digital therapeutic all the more greater and because we want people to feel comfortable and then, then really engage in the therapeutic process, even if it's a micro process. Um, other things, obviously, Wobot would, can stay with you for a lifetime, but the, the really the piece that um, helps a conversational or a relational agent be really well suited to this field is the fact that lots of research groups have shown that people would rather disclose to an AI than a human sometimes. And so it really is that emotional emotional accessibility, that easy on-ramp um, so that people can really know that they can reach out for something that's helpful in a moment of need. Um, the pathway to better outcomes is about uh, being fast acting. So when you have these two things together, unlimited capacity and meaningful engagement, you can get outcomes really quickly um, because people are engaging really quickly. So when I was uh, treating adolescents, my mentor would say, you know, for the first few sessions with a, with a kid, don't don't even try and do intervene and, and just try and get to know them. You have to build that rapport. They have to see you as a human being and not as a threat. And it takes a long time to build that rapport. Well, with an AI actually, um, it seems like it doesn't, right? It's implicit that this thing doesn't judge me because it can't have judgment. Um, and then, you know, we have the opportunity with this technology as well to be responsive to the pe to people's needs in real time versus what has come before us, which is these sort of one size fit all interventions that lean heavily on online learning methods. Um, some of the other pieces that I think it's important to point out is this one of the uh, our safety net protocol, which is comprised of what is our procedure when we did when robot detects that somebody is sharing that they're in crisis. Um, and that is now almost 99% accurate with really high precision and recall because we've had the opportunity to it was one of the first things that we launched we bootstrapped with regexes and then moved over to a full <coughs> excuse me machine true sort of machine learning model um and you know it's just the strength of having a lot of data to learn on then you know you can you can get to to, to really high accuracy when it counts um oops excuse me Oop. so this is we we built Wobot to to into a sort of what what st started as the single intervention for people with um, symptoms of depression and anxiety is kind of built into more of a platform that um, is able to target specific illness mechanism, drawing from these different uh, therapeutic approaches, both cognitive behavioral therapy again, dialectical behavior therapy, and interpersonal therapy, depending on the presenting problem. So, for for example, if somebody's grieving, Wobot will then um, invite the user to go through a process from interpersonal therapy where we invite people to process the loss, talk about the person and so on. And that's not a moment, for example, where you would invite someone to challenge whether their thinking is distorted and that's not appropriate, right? Whereas that would be appropriate for as if somebody was dealing with anxiety, for example. Um, so our, enable, our ability to be responsive is, is really how Wobot understands a state and training level input and responds appropriately, both in the moment and then seeing shifts over time in that individual. Um, and then, of course, the other piece that we build for is Wobot being related. And so I've, I've spoken about this a little bit, but removing barriers to disclosure um, by being super transparent by being trustworthy, by demonstrating that you have deep knowledge of their lived experience, which um, is has been really absent to date and um, to, to previous behavioral health interventions. And why does it matter? This is um, this is a graph 
that shows from a recently published um, study on 36,000 of our users where we administered a measure called the Working Alliance Inventory. And we found that a robot could achieve a bond score um, in the very clearly in the human range when we um, the, the sort of non-equivalent, sorry, non-inferior to um, other published studies of therap therapy, um, therapist delivered interventions across modalities like individual CBT, group CBT and, and, and so on. As you see, well, what's very much clear is clearly scoring in the human range. But what's interesting is that we took the measure within the first three to five days after an initial conversation, which is much earlier than, you know, what you see from the traditional human um, delivered modalities, which were all the two in six weeks. Um, and then it doesn't appear to erode over time as well. So we took another measure at eight weeks and it's almost exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> and why does that matter? Well, it is about these outcomes. Um, I oh, I want to look at the a clock, but I don't have one because it's in a box somewhere. Um, so I'm going to just keep going quickly. But and this is these are some early uh, data points that we have on the left hand side is from the our first uh, randomized control trial that we um, effectively launched the company with in 2017 and um, showing that among uh, people aged 18 to 28, um, it's a young adult sample, they uh, we saw those that spoke to Wobot had a significant meaningful reduction in depression in two weeks compared to a control group um, who had uh, just psychoeducation only. Um, and what's meaningful about that is that, again, this two week time point is really, really early. Uh, so you wouldn't imagine in conventional treatment that you would get a, a shift like this in just two sessions. Um, but it's also equivalent to the time frame. That's the absolute earliest that antidepressants begin to work. So it's significant because the um, across problems and across modalities, early response to treatment is the most predictive of overall positive outcomes. So that's great. And the middle study is from a published another published RCT that we did. It was a feasibility study at Stanford, another Stanford led study, but different um, group. Um, and this was among postpartum women showing that um, after six weeks, Wobot led to a 30% reduction in depression scores, even though they started off in the quite the mild range. What was interesting about this study is that women, uh, um, yeah, very few of these women were actually ill. Um, you know, they weren't, they were doing pretty okay. And, and yet they still checked in every week, uh, at least once or twice um, for a six week period. So there was really high acceptability and this just seemed to be something that worked. Again, reference that waking up at 3 a.m. and there's no one else to talk to piece. Um, and then the last graph on the right is a, a retrospective cohort study. So this is aggregate de-identified data from among adults, oh, sorry, adolescents, 12 to 19 year olds, 3,400 of them, showing that among those who start off having moderate or severe level symptoms, after four weeks, they drop, 65% of them are dropping a full range at least. Um, so they're going from the severe range to the moderate range or the moderate range to the mild range. Um, and as you can see, a lot of that change is driven in the first two weeks. Um, and what I think is exciting about this is that having come from child and adolescent psychiatry um, where the you know median length of an intervention is 19 sessions but only on average 3.4 are ever um, uh, completed by people you know it's really hard to get kids into the clinic it's really disruptive for their life um, and this was a just a naturalistic look at who is on our platform and 75 <clears> percent <throat> of these kids were still there at four weeks um, which is just, it's, it's, it's really positive. So a little bit on the team before we, we drop off, but so I um, I founded the company obviously, and uh, but I was I uh, was working with Andrew Ng, um, <clears throat> whose name you'll probably be familiar with, co-founded Coursera, co-founded the Google, Google Brain project, and he's also an early investor in our company. Um, but, you know, Andrew and I literally sat around my kitchen table in San Francisco and um, kind of bugged people on the street about if they would talk to us and um, had a really good time. And it's I blame him for me starting the company, honestly. Um, but I ran his health innovation lab at Stanford for a while before we decided to, to leave Stanford and create a company. Um, Joe Gallagher, also uh, just, a, just a, a superstar um, and uh, Galway and UIG alumnus um, 
and also Trinity and uh, then went on to do postdocs at Stanford and Caltech and then did um, uh, and the insight program in, in the US um, to, to sort of repurpose skills for industry and then went on to do to work in Beats Music and Reddit and he ran uh, and just all kinds of stuff, but really brilliant. So he runs our product team, which is sort of an unusual profile for a VP of product. And Casey Sackett, our CTO, has a background in math from MIT and was always and then also spent a while in some of the, the, the best psychology labs in the US trying to see if he could quantify the field. And so you can see there's a there's a pattern here. Um, and then a former colleague of mine, a friend, Athena Robinson is our chief clinical officer. And um, she was an associate professor at Stanford Psychiatry and joined. And then Monique Levy, her most recently um, ran Black ran, ran strategy in Blackthorn Therapeutics, which is a uh, a data driven um, uh, sort of pharma company attempting to again tease apart mechanism using um, big data sets to figure out uh, the next sort of uh, generation of CNS medications. And then Michael Evers joined as our CEO just over a year ago, um, and just uh, a fantastic guy. What I adore is that his background and so from our first conversation that we had talking about patients like me where he ran that company which was also a data-driven company learning a lot about people and just you know just a ton of compassion um, about uh, you know how people really need to be connected in, in when they're in an illness state. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I have no idea how much time that took. I apologize. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not over. <laughs>